Plato impacted and confounded the Western mind like few others. With his tendency to avoid direct statements of fact, to mythologize the truth, and to cloak his ideas in several layers of narrative, his philosophy came to us in allegory and riddle. But nevertheless, the essential idealistic doctrine resonated with the eternal aspect of man, and the flame he lit has proved inextinguishable. Since Plato described Atlantis in his Timaeus, lives have been spent in search of this enigmatic lost civilization. Prehistory is shrouded from us by the mists of time, and so it is used as a vehicle for the projection of our myths. The once upon a time of European folklore is equipollent to the dream time of the central Australian Aborigines, and both denote some occasion in the distant past before the order of the world had been fully established. We tend to represent the archetypal qualities of the psyche as being incarnated through hyperbolic human or animal figures at some unknowable time in the distant past. Atlantis has been used for this same purpose, but as the fidelity of our conception of prehistory improves through advancing techniques of archaeology and genetics, much of the mist is being dispelled, and the magical sense of a far-off dream time is being replaced by a less romantic but much clearer image of the ruthless struggle for survival that our ancestors endured. As the mists clear, and we examine the evidence, will we find a reality behind the Atlantis myth? We know that some aspects of the Atlantis story are certainly true, that there have been many lost island cultures, that the human journey has not been a single line of progress, that there have been historic or geological events which reset much of the knowledge of mankind, and that there have been ancient Atlantic cultures, which built on a grand scale and attained sublimated spiritual realities. Without placing too much emphasis on a literal interpretation of Plato's myth, I'd like to examine the possibility of a comparatively advanced island culture somewhere west of the Pillars of Hercules, which had considerable influence on Mediterranean culture before the first written systems developed in the 4th millennium BC. Over 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens began interbreeding with the Neanderthal. Immediately following this admixture, the cultural and technological achievement worldwide increased greatly. There seems to have been some significant advantage gained by at least a portion of the new biracial population. Many Eurasian myths tell of the decline of the ages, and this correlates with the decline of both brain size and Neanderthal admixture in the general population, which occurred since the time of the Cro-Magnon man. Human remains from as recently as 5,000 years ago in Europe have over 5% Neanderthal DNA, whereas the modern European population ranges from 1% to 4%. Could some Cro-Magnon population have intentionally or unintentionally escaped this decline by taking refuge in the islands west of Gibraltar. The Neanderthal navigated the Mediterranean by boat as far back as 150,000 years ago, and heavily Neanderthal admixed people may have retained the use of boats for a time, allowing European communities which sought to retain their Neanderthal traditions during the Paleolithic demographic decline to seek refuge offshore in order to avoid succumbing to the way of life of the increasingly Homo sapiens population of the late Gravedian period. Europe was sparsely populated during the age of the Neanderthal, possibly totaling no greater than 70,000 individuals. The Cro-Magnon population which replaced the Neanderthal grew well beyond this. A similar phenomenon occurred during the Neolithic, as Mesolithic Europeans carrying old European genetic markers like Y-DNA haplotype I were mostly replaced by Neolithic farmers carrying Anatolian and Near Eastern genetic markers like Y-DNA haplotype R1b and haplotype E, due to the much greater reproductive rate of the latter, enabled by agriculture. The Mesolithic lifestyle did not stop altogether. It withdrew to environments which were not suitable to Neolithic agriculture, like Scandinavia. Could a similar exodus have occurred during Aragnation times? We know that a purely Neanderthal population in refuge survived just north of the Strait of Gibraltar in southern Spain until as recently as 24,000 years ago. Could not a group of original Cro-Magnons have done the same offshore? One approach to answering this question 
would be to consider the nature of the spread of the admixed population. The first archaeological evidence of admixture in Europe is found in the Carpathian Mountains in Romania, around 37,000 years ago. Based on the technological advances in both Levantine Homo sapiens and Central European Neanderthal between 55,000 BC and 40,000 BC, it seems that admixture already occurred sporadically before the Aeryngnation phase, but that there was still a sharp contrast between a largely microlithic, spear-throwing, predominantly Homo sapiens industry, moving up from Palestine, and a more symbolic and ritualistic spear-holding tradition in the Neanderthal north. From the archaeological record, it appears that some relatively cohesive cultural entity combined aspects of both cultures in Southeast Europe, perhaps first in Bulgaria, before spreading this way of life along the Danube into Central Europe, where it matured into the Arab nation proper. Neanderthal had an extremely high in-group preference, and existed in perpetual war with its nearest neighbors. So it is difficult to explain how a group of Homo sapiens would have acquired the sophisticated Neanderthal technology. Modern anthropologists have difficulty reproducing Neanderthal artifacts, apparently due to the fact that Neanderthal had an extremely high degree of respect for tradition, and its methods of production were highly ritualized to preserve the sacred forms of their tools. One explanation for this acquisition of Neanderthal knowledge may lie in the Carpathian Mountains, where the first admixed remains are found. The Carpathian Sphinx is a natural rock formation in a high mountain valley. This valley was occupied by Neanderthal in ancient times. This area possesses a number of features which would lend it to use as a ritual site. The Sphinx is so called because of the great resemblance it bears to a human head. It's aligned to the west with the setting sun. There are caves in this valley, which have impressive acoustic properties, and platforms which would be suitable for the performance of music or ritual. There are several depressions in flat rock surfaces, which appear to have been at least in part the result of exposure to contact with human hands over many generations. Many primitive and modern peoples believe that sacredness can be gathered from peculiar objects through direct contact. The Sphinx itself may have come to resemble a human head more greatly through artificial erosion as generation after generation touched this sacred object. It has been suggested that this site was more than just a tribal home, that because of its striking natural beauty, and no doubt the mystery of the human head coming out of the earth, it served as a site of pilgrimage for several Neanderthal tribes. If a cult of the Sphinx did exist for many generations, it may have bred into existence a strain of Neanderthal which was capable of a much greater expansion of in-group. A cult such as this would likely have developed a line of priests whose sacred task was the performance of Sphinx-related ritual and protection of the Sacred Valley. It may be significant that the first admixed specimens are found so close to the Sphinx. It is possible that some Near Eastern Homo sapiens, perhaps already admixed with the Palestinian Neanderthal, made its way into Romania, bore witness to this cult of the Sphinx, and remained nearby to develop in cooperation with these unusually outgroup tolerant, spiritually minded Neanderthal. Homo sapiens has always had a tendency to expand, whereas Neanderthal stayed within their native land. The admixed members of the Sphinx cult may have expanded the way of life, divorcing it from its particular sacred geographical basis and abstracting it into an attitude towards the greater reality. Could this have been, in part, the cause of the great flourishing of art and culture during the Arab nation? If a priest class did accompany the Sphinx cult, did the priest class spread with the Arab nation culture? Regardless, my hypothesis is that one way or the other, some group of Kermanians made its way to the Azores Islands. In 2013, a yacht off the coast of the Azores Islands discovered a geometric pyramidal structure underwater with its depth finder. 
I'm not alone in seeing the Atlantis connections with this story, and it's very difficult to get good information on this subject. Government sonar would have been able to map this anomaly long before a recreational deep-sea fisherman, but official channels are notably silent. There are other ancient structures on the Azores Islands, most of which are claimed to date from the second millennium BC. This parallels the time frame given for some megalithic cultures of the Mediterranean. One interesting feature is held in common between the Azores and Malta, the enigmatic cart ruts. These ruts run in several cases underwater on Malta, and anthropologists are not in agreement as to their function or age. The Azores Islands pyramid structure was last above sea level over 17,000 years ago. If the Azores Islands were populated during the Aragnation or Gervedian periods, an isolated Cro-Magnon culture could have developed apart from the increasingly migratory way of life on the continent. It could have preserved the Neanderthal respect for tradition, the Cro-Magnon artistic talent, and possibly even the priest class of the Carpathian Sphinx cult. Island cultures of the Western Mediterranean began to employ megalithic structures before the larger proto-civilizations of the Near East, perhaps partly due to the highly stratified social hierarchies which form in island territories in response to resource scarcity. Could an Atlantic island culture have developed megalithic technology in the late Paleolithic? If it did on the Azores Islands, we might expect that the original sites would have been repurposed by Neolithic people, just as Greek temples were repurposed by Romans, and Persian temples were repurposed by Greeks. Only the inundated megalithic sites would have remained undisturbed. If it is true that a highly socially stratified megalithic culture evolved during the late Paleolithic in the Azores, then the question may fairly be asked, what became of these Atlanteans? If they lost considerable low-lying territories due to sea level rise, reducing their food supply, they may have migrated elsewhere. And to my knowledge, there is only one place where the megalithic tradition existed before 10,000 BC. Bosnia. The Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun is labeled pseudo-archaeology by the mainstream, and while it is true that the current investigators are amateur, there are a number of details that are difficult to reconcile. The Bosnian Pyramid is a natural hill greatly resembling a pyramid, which was either artificially or naturally lined with concrete. There are 14,000 years of sediment built up on top of this concrete layer. The excavations show clear-cut straight edges and channels, though mainstream archaeology will contend that this has been fabricated by the amateur investigative team. The most difficult fact to dismiss is the system of tunnels which run under the pyramid. There are stalactites and stalagmites dated at least 5,000 years old in these tunnels, indicating that they were unknown by and unused by the civilizations of antiquity. The Neolithic of Bosnia is not very well documented, and it's difficult to find much information on the Illyrians who inhabited the territory before 3000 BC. If the Atlanteans made it to Bosnia, they might have eventually made it further to the east, to southeastern Anatolia, where in 9500 BC, the first layer of Gobekli Tepe was constructed. Gobekli Tepe consists of 200 rings of massive T-shaped pillars, dwarfing Stonehenge or any other Neolithic megalithic site for thousands of years. Gobekli Tepe demonstrates a high degree of social organization and most likely a priest class. Nearby Navali Kori indicates a sharp division between the elites of the society and the rest. Genetic studies have recently shown that 8,000 years ago, 17 females were reproducing for every one male, showing a monopoly of resources on the part of the emerging Neolithic elite. Only one non-Atlantean terrestrial candidate for the construction of Go Gobekli Tepe seems plausible, which would be the North Syrian migrant population of the Natufians. 
Tel Abu Herrera in north-central Syria began as a refuge of a Natufian band during the Younger Dryas. At Abu Herrera, in order to survive, the Natufians began intentionally sowing the grains that they had previously gathered. This may have been the birth of Neolithic agriculture. By 9500 BC, Abu Herrera's population swelled to 2,000 individuals. But could these 2,000 individuals have produced the giant stone structures to their north? Abu Herrera indicates no such megalithic tradition. An alternative explanation is that the population at Abu Herrera, possibly the largest village in Western Asia at the time, was seen as a resource by a people who already had a megalithic tradition. A history of the early Neolithic demonstrates that the agricultural technologies brought together at Gobekli Tepe were exported as a package through colonies and trade over a wide area of South Asia, West Asia, Anatolia, North Africa, and Southeast Europe. The Neolithic elite social model was most likely based on bloodline, and those bloodlines probably have not died out. Plato's description of Atlantis is put in the mouth of an Egyptian sage who describes how the Greeks live in perpetual childhood due to the tendency for their history to be wiped out by disaster. Plato was initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries and was a member of the Athenian social elite. It is entirely possible that he was veiling in myth a hidden truth about our history. Could the Atlantean bloodlines pass down their history while veiling the truth from the masses, keeping us in perpetual childhood, and therefore in a state to receive a historical narrative of their own construction? This may be the true story. 70,000 years ago, the Neanderthal of the Carpathian Mountains begin a series of rituals to venerate a particular rock. This developed into a regional cult, expanding the outgroup tolerance of these Neanderthal. Near Eastern, possibly admixed Homo sapiens, entered the area and joined this cult, learning European Neanderthal spirituality and technology. These Homo sapiens took these ideas and expanded them through the Arab nation culture. This way of life was at some point brought to the Azores Islands, where over the millennia, the technology moved from small statues to big statues, and the power of the priest class became more absolute. Whereas on the continent, plains replaced forest, and Cro-Magnon populations started falling big game seasonally. When the low-lying territories of Atlantis sank, the Atlantean priest class moved into the Mediterranean, eventually reaching Bosnia, where they established their old model of life, with a powerful priest class using monumental architecture to inspire awe and the belief in the semi-divinity of the priests. The priests learned of the growing Syrian town of Abu Herrera and the method of, fru of food production which allowed for it. They established a monumental site to the north of these late Natufians, and harvested their labor in exchange for spiritual teaching and access to the sacred monument. The priests of Gobekli Tepe took the technologies of husbandry and agriculture that they gained from the Near Eastern natives and turned them into a systematic way of life, which they replicated through colonies, establishing themselves in privileged social positions. The expansion of why haplotypes K and R1B is of particular interest for this investigation, and I believe that this theory may help to explain some of the unusual distribution patterns of these haplogroups. If you have any other facts which may be relevant to this hypothesis, please share them. Supporting or contradicting material is welcome. Thank you for listening.